Ugaki noted in his diary that the idea of the operation in the Indian Ocean was not good. The exercise suggested that it would be difficult to locate the enemy's fleet and that enemy air power would badly hinder operations. However, the results of the wargaming were apparently good enough to continue studying the operation, with increasing attention given to the capture of Ceylon. For the time being, the army was going along with the concept, and it seemed to be interested in expanding operations along the Indian front in the near future. However, within a matter of a few weeks, the bloom was apparently off the rose. Indeed, just five days after the exercises on Yamato wrapped up, no mention was made of such operations at a high-level liaison meeting in Tokyo. Part of this resulted from the continuing reluctance on the part of the army to open a new theatre and thereby commit ground troops, planning estimates had called for a minimum of five divisions, for garrison duties in places like Ceylon. Not only that, but the army began to become suspicious that by committing substantial numbers of new troops to any coming Indian Ocean venture, it would undermine its previously successful strategy of being able to veto any new operation on the basis of troops simply not being available. The army suspected that the navy might get it to commit to the Indian Ocean and then pull a bait and switch back to the eastern operational front while simultaneously demanding to use forces that were now known to be available. Given this possibility, however far-fetched, the army apparently judged that a return to sophistry was the less risky strategy. A further complicating factor was that by mid-March, the army was beginning to face up to the fact that operations in Burma were going to require more support than had been anticipated. With Rangoon having fallen on March 8th, the army was shortly to turn north to chase the British out of Burma and into India, requiring a long advance up the Irrawaddy River into very inhospitable terrain. Logistically, the army was getting near the end of its rope. The later construction of the infamous Burma Railroad was but one indication of the difficulties Japan faced in keeping pressure on India via this axis of advance. The addition of Ceylon would have vastly complicated these problems. Finally, matters were not helped by Germany's signalling that it would not carry out operations in the Middle East aimed at securing their portion of the land bridge to Asia. This weakened the overall rationale behind an adventure in the Indian Ocean, at least from the standpoint of generating propaganda. Taken together, this option was dead by the end of March. Other than Nagumo's coming April Raiden operation that had been in the works for some time, no further moves were anticipated. So far as Army and Naval GHQ knew, the only strategic alternative now left standing was the Southwest Pacific. On 13th of March, Naval GHQ and the Army formally ratified the notion of operations against Fiji and Samoa. In this, they were further supported by Admiral Inoue, who had recently suffered two setbacks that argued for more attention being paid to this theatre. The first was an abortive raid on Rabaul on 20th of February by an American carrier, Lexington, under the command of Vice Admiral Wilson Brown. During the course of this action, the Americans had taught the Japanese a painful lesson concerning the vulnerability of both their aircraft and their defensive perimeter as a whole. Brown's intention was to launch a hit-and-run attack. However, his task force had been detected while still too far away to launch its aircraft. Rabaul was hardly undefended, and the base air commander had dispatched his entire group of 17 Type 1 land attack aircraft, later codenamed Betty by the Allies, from the recently activated 4th KK Thai against the American carrier. The ensuing engagement was a minor disaster. Fifteen of the squadron's bombers had been shot down, with no damage against the enemy to show for it. This was an ominous development indeed. Rabul was an important installation and ought to have been able to defend itself from such a raid. That it could not cast a pall over one of Japan's basic strategic premises namely that a perimeter buttressed by bases such as Rabaul could be defended against American incursions. Then, barely a month later, on 10th of March, came a second stunning reversal. American carriers had again appeared in southern waters and launched surprise attacks against Japanese forces making landings against the towns of Leh and Salamaua on the northern coast of New Guinea. 
Two American carriers, Lexington again, along with Yorktown, both under Vice Admiral Brown, had launched 104 aircraft within sight of New Guinea's southern coast. From there, the Americans had flown across the towering Owen Stanley Mountains and then down upon the Japanese invasion forces, which were taken completely unawares. The material effects were dramatic. Two-thirds of the invasion transports were either damaged or sunk. The only thing that had prevented more army casualties was the fact that many of the transports had been close to shore when the Americans attacked, allowing several of the ships to beach themselves. In psychological terms, this raid had an even larger impact than had the 4th Kokutai's mauling. The army, for its part, was horrified at the prospect of similar attacks. Likewise, Vice Admiral Inoue immediately discerned that the days of easy pickings were over in his theatre of operations. Allied resistance was stiffening, enemy air activity was on the rise, and the Americans were clearly willing to employ their carriers to contest Japanese moves in the region. Shoestring operations were no longer viable in the face of such opposition. If Inoue was to complete the southern defensive perimeter, he needed help from combined fleet to augment his tiny forces. Inoue was supported in his views by the naval general staff. In light of these unwholesome developments, Inoue invited a member of combined fleet staff to confer with him at Truk. His goal was to lobby for more support from Yamamoto. The well-travelled Captain Miwa, arriving on 13th of March, agreed with Inoue that more support was needed. But the Navy's fleet carriers were currently unavailable, because they were about to enter the Indian Ocean. However, Miwa assured Inoue that a carrier division could be freed up to assist him within about a month. Inoue was encouraged by Miwa to write up a proposal and submit it to combined fleet. Thereupon, Miwa departed. What Inoue discovered upon submission of his proposals in early April, though, was that he had been sold a bill of goods. No carriers were forthcoming, as Yamamoto had already earmarked them for operations in early June operations aimed at the Central Pacific. During March, unbeknownst to anyone else, Yamamoto and Ugaki had begun turning their attentions back to the Central Pacific. In the opinion of Yamamoto, the fact that American carriers had recently shown an interest in Inoue's theatre was less important than the simple fact that the Americans still had carriers at all. As such, interdicting Australian supply lines in Fiji was secondary to eliminating the naval strength that underwrote the safety of those supply lines. Consequently, Japanese operations should be aimed at their destruction. In fact, this was exactly the same objective that Yamamoto's opponent, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz intended to achieve as well. Since Yamamoto held the initiative, though, it was up to him to create the conditions whereby the Americans could be brought to battle. At this point in the war, Japan believed that the US Navy had probably been reduced to a quartet of fleet carriers in the Pacific. Lexington was believed to have been sunk early in the war by submarine attack. This left Saratoga and the three Yorktown-class carriers Yorktown Enterprise and Hornet, available in the Pacific. The location of the remaining American carrier, Wasp, was unknown. The smaller Ranger, which the Japanese factored into their calculations, was believed to be in the Atlantic. This meant a theoretical maximum of five American carriers to deal with. However, since it was, presumably, unthinkable that the Americans would have a clear sense for Japanese intentions, it was considered equally unlikely that all five would be in the same location when the Japanese attacked. Yamamoto was confident that with all six of his large carriers, Nagumo could deal with any enemy force he encountered. It is perhaps not surprising that the destruction of America's carriers had taken on such a heavy dose of symbolism in Yamamoto's eyes. The mere existence of these vessels, effective or not illustrated the absurdity of the war Japan had gotten itself into, while Japan's initial victories had been spectacular, they had also been ultimately empty in that the war-making potential of the United States remained intact. It was true that America had been expelled from its Pacific dominions and that its navy had been battered and humiliated at Pearl Harbor, but the Americans were still willing to fight and had declared that nothing short of total victory would satisfy their war aims against Japan.
Herein lay the fundamental strategic conundrum that now faced the Japanese how to force to the negotiating table an enemy who, although wounded, was both vastly more powerful in the long term and in the short term had demonstrated a furious disinclination to bargain. Likewise, Japan had to grapple with the question of how to secure, once and for all, the economic underpinnings of its new empire against an enemy whose economy was not only much larger but also largely untouchable. Clear-cut as these problems may have been, the potential solution was far from obvious. In fact, it probably didn't exist. Having initiated the war with a surprise attack, it was almost certainly beyond her means to cajole the Americans to the table no matter what military setbacks she subsequently foisted on her adversary. Given the lack of readily identifiable exit strategies, Admiral Yamamoto's answer to continue offensive operations aimed at the destruction of the American fleet was predictable, and yet ultimately empty. Yamamoto was convinced that the best way to lure the American carriers out was to attack an objective the Americans could not relinquish without a fight. As related previously, his first notion had been to attack Hawaii directly. But American strength on the Hawaiian Islands had ballooned since the time of December 7th, and the seas and skies around them were now too heavily patrolled to allow a repeat visit from Nagumo on anything like the favourable terms he had achieved in December. Yet Yamamoto reasoned that an attack against an intermediate objective that placed Hawaii in danger would be met with a vigorous American response. At the same time, the objective needed to be outside the range of US air power stationed in Hawaii, thereby curtailing its ability to intervene directly in the battle. The place of attack he selected was the island of Midway. Aptly named, it sat in the middle of the Pacific at the far tip of the Hawaiian chain, some 1-300 miles northwest of Oahu. On the face of it, Yamamoto's objective hardly seemed worth a good bar fight, let alone a decisive sea battle. Midway was a tiny atoll, composed of two islands, Sand and Eastern, surrounded by a coral reef. Both islands together comprised less than two square miles of real estate. Eastern Island, the smaller of the two, was almost totally covered by the three crisscrossing landing strips of an American airbase. Japanese intelligence estimated that 50-odd aircraft were operating from it. Sand Island held the majority of the shore facilities, barracks and the new American seaplane base. This installation, which the Americans had completed just prior to the war at the then staggering cost of $20 million, hosted a number of Catalina PBY flying boats that patrolled the seas in all directions. However, given the diminutive size of Midway itself, there was little chance that the Americans could operate a very large air group there, no matter how much money they poured into its facilities. The value of Midway lay not in the intrinsic value of its facilities, but rather in its location. Capturing Midway would allow the Japanese to establish themselves within the Hawaiian Islands. Midway could theoretically be used as a springboard for future operations aimed at the conquest of Hawaii itself, although its practical value as an advanced base was limited. However, holding Midway would enable the Japanese to intercept American raiding forces operating in the empty expanse of waters north and west of the Hawaiian Islands. It would also prevent the island from being used by the Americans for attacks against Wake. As such, Yamamoto reasoned that the Americans would be compelled to fight for it. Given that the naval general staff was still behind the Fiji-Samoa option, and combined fleets supported the Central Pacific option, things were bound to come to a head once GHQ became aware of Yamamoto's rekindled intentions. A series of staff meetings in Tokyo during April 5, 1942, was the venue for the showdown between the two camps. The battle was fought by proxy, with both sides using staff officers to duke it out, while Yamamoto remained sequestered on board Yamato at Hashirajima. At Naval GHQ, Yamamoto's errand boy, Captain Watanabe Yasuji, laid out combined fleet's proposal to the assembled officers. Yamamoto's scheme was immediately taken under fire by Admiral Fukudome's three top planners, Captain Tomioka and his two leading subordinates, Commanders Yamamoto Yuji and Mio Tatsukichi. Commander Mio, 
himself an air officer and classmate of Watanabe's from Staff College, was particularly well suited to commenting on Admiral Yamamoto's plan. He promptly meted out a withering criticism. Mio's critique was based on three fundamentally sound objections. The first was that in attempting to attack Midway, the Navy would be reversing the formula that had worked so well during the previous months. In the opening operations of the war, the Japanese had advanced under the cover of land-based air power, quickly establishing themselves at captured bases and moving the air umbrella forward. In this new operation, though, they would be attacking across the Pacific without such support. By the same token, Midway was itself an outpost of a far larger enemy bastion, Oahu, which could support it with relative ease. Midway was within range of American heavy bombers, but was too far from Hawaii to allow Japanese fighter aircraft to extend their own sphere of influence over the main islands. It is important to recall that at this stage in the development of naval aviation, conducting extended carrier operations in the face of enemy land-based air power was infeasible. Kidobutai couldn't stand off a hostile enemy base and hope to wear it down through attrition. This capability, the very definition of the true carrier task force, would not be created until later in the war, when the US Navy brought its vastly superior logistics capabilities to bear. Kido Butai, although powerful, was a raiding force, and this is exactly how the Japanese understood its usage. Once Midway was captured, Nagumo would be forced to retire and replenish. At that point, Midway would be on its own, exposed to Hawaii-based air and sea power. This led directly to the second point. Even if Midway was captured, it was unlikely that it could be supported, particularly in the face of concerted enemy submarine attack. The Japanese merchant marine was already overtaxed. Japan had begun the war at a disadvantage in that many of her imports had previously been carried in either neutral or allied ships. When war was declared, Japan in effect lost millions of tonnes worth of shipping overnight. These difficulties were compounded by the need to support the military's troop transport missions, which pulled more tonnage out of service to the civilian economy. Unnecessarily impacting this already overstretched network was to be avoided at all costs. The truth was that every mile that Japan's defensive perimeter expanded placed an additional two miles of burden on the nation's shipping because ships not only had to go out to the newly captured base, but also had to return. Given that there was nothing on Midway even vaguely worth transporting home, those ships would return empty. Every mile travelled in ballast, of course, lowered the overall efficiency of Japan's merchant marine still further. As a result, shipping difficulties increased at a geometric rate in relation to the distance of the defensive perimeter from the home islands. Whether or not Mio understood this problem in precisely this fashion is unlikely, but he and his fellow staff officers could tell instantly that keeping the island in supply would be exceedingly difficult. Mio also correctly pointed out that Midway itself was tiny and could only support a small air group, thus mitigating its usefulness as an advance base to be used against the hundreds of American aircraft known to be on Hawaii. Yet, even keeping a diminutive air group operating in the face of such opposition would be difficult. Midway was so small that dispersing aircraft would be impossible. This raised the spectre of suffering outsized aircraft losses on the ground in the event of American bombing. Mio knew that aircraft shortages were already a serious problem in the fleet. How did Yamamoto propose to keep Midway supplied with aircraft given the likely attrition rates it would suffer? In the same vein, Mio doubted that sufficient aviation gasoline could be provided. Japan's stock of tankers was small, and most were already tied up supporting the fleet or transporting crude oil from the southern resource areas back to the home islands. Keeping aircraft operating on Midway would require a major logistics effort, a fact that Yamamoto's proposals ignored. Mio's third and final critique was that attacking Midway would not provoke the type of reaction from the Americans that Yamamoto blandly assumed. In Mio's opinion, Midway was superfluous to the ultimate defence of Hawaii, for the very reasons just laid out. The Americans could afford to cede their outlying outpost – 
and then reclaim it whenever the Japanese logistical thread showed signs of fraying. In the meantime, Japan's ownership would not jeopardize Hawaii's position in the slightest. Why? Mio asked. Would the Americans react as violently as Yamamoto assumed they would over such an insignificant speck of land? In Mio's opinion, and that of the naval general staff, launching operations that severed American communications with Australia were far more likely to provoke the needed reaction. If the Americans were serious about using Australia as a base for future operations and their recent commitment of carriers to this area indicated that this was so, they could not help but respond vigorously to any threat to its supply lines. Furthermore, a campaign in this region of the Pacific, while distant from Japan, would at least place an equal burden of distance on the Americans. Precipitating combat near Hawaii handed the Americans the advantage of fighting from interior lines. It seems clear that Watanabe found himself in an unenviable position. Unable to counter Mio's arguments, he was on the verge of angry tears. The truth was that Mio's critique was far better thought out than Yamamoto's plan. Despite being flustered, though, Watanabe refused to be lured into an argument against Mio's well-reasoned objections. Instead, he simply restated Combined Fleet's position by rote, presenting its arguments as incontrovertible fact. This inability to engage Yamamoto's lackey in any form of rational discourse soured Tomioka and Mio's moods still further. In the end, under increasing pressure from GHQ, Watanabe was forced to appeal to his chief to intercede. Placing a call to Yamato, Watanabe asked Yamamoto to comment on Mio's alternative proposal for actions in the Southwest Pacific. Yamamoto replied that the most effective way of severing the American lines of communication was to destroy the means whereby these lines were maintained, namely their carriers. He also argued that in the unlikely event that the Americans did not bite at Midway, Japan would win a bloodless victory there that extended the defensive perimeter outward. Yamamoto, in other words, was unmoved. Furthermore, the manner of his delivery and his unflinching support for an aide who had just been logically dismembered made it clear that he was prepared once again to resign unless he got his way. The naval general staff, having already lost this game once, was in a much worse position to call Yamamoto's bluff this time, particularly in light of Yamamoto's successes over the previous months. Predictably, when push came to shove, the naval general staff caved in once more. The men in a position to actually do something about Yamamoto's near-insubordination Fukudome and Nagano apparently did nothing to defend their subordinates against what was, in essence, a coup against their own authority. Nagano thereupon grudgingly ratified Yamamoto's basic operational plan on 5th April. All that remained now was for Yamamoto's staff to work out the details. As one historian has noted, this was a disgraceful way of conducting a war. Nagano and Fukudome had essentially ceded all responsibility for planning to combined fleet and had elevated Yamamoto's writ to law. No one was now in a position to challenge his authority. Yamamoto had also demonstrated precisely what sort of leader he was, one who ruled through intimidation rather than reason and who was not prepared to accept criticism. However, Yamamoto's victory came at a price. In return for GHQ's grudging adoption of Midway as the objective of the next operation, Yamamoto was shortly forced to accede to first one and later a second of the naval staff's demands. The first, which greatly affected Yamamoto's operational planning for his decisive battle, was an agreement to incorporate an attack on the Aleutian Islands into the overall scheme for June's operations. The second concession, as we shall see shortly, would be a decision to support a limited incursion into the southwest Pacific prior to the attack on Midway. Thus, a strategic formulation process that should have logically reached a final decision in favour of a unified strategy with a single near-term objective, in fact resulted in de facto support for three objectives in two theatres, none of which was mutually reinforcing. Nothing better illustrates the depths to which Japan's policymaking had sunk on the eve of its great battle. An attack into the Aleutians had not originally been part of Yamamoto's vision, 
Rather, it was an idea that had been kicked around by lower-level officers within Army and Naval GHQ. Capturing the Aleutians was seen as a means of forestalling US offensives, both by air and naval forces, toward northern Japan. In Naval GHQ's conception, Operation AL would have been conducted at the very beginning of the second phase operations, before any of the major offensives were opened. However, during the heated April exchanges, it was decided to attack both Midway and the Aleutians in early June. This was agreed to by Nagano on 5 April as well, and orders were issued to that effect on 16 April. Thereafter, Yamamoto handed off the detailed planning to Captain Kurashima. The inclusion of the Aleutians widened the overall scope of planning enormously. The area of campaign now encompassed a trapezoidal area bounded on the north and south by the 1,500-mile lengths of both the Aleutian and Hawaiian island chains, and spanning the 2,400-odd miles in between. This represented an area of nearly 4 million square miles, or roughly 2% of the surface area of the globe, most of it composed of the stormy waters of the North Pacific. It was an outsized battlefield, to say the least. Even with the ambitious inclusion of the Aleutians into the overall scheme, follow-on operations against Hawaii had not been authorised because army ratification would be required for such an undertaking. Indeed, at this point, the army had not yet even agreed to contribute forces to securing Midway, let alone the divisions that would have been required for Hawaii. Unfortunately for the long-suffering Captain Tomioka, now that Admirals Fukudome and Nagano had given their assent, thereby making it the Navy's plan rather than just combined fleets, it fell to him to sell the idea to the army. Though he doubtless viewed the task ahead with a distaste bordering on nausea, on 12th April he dutifully met with General Tanaka. The meeting did not go well. The general was a sharp customer, and though Tomioka did his level best to deliver a version of the plan that would deflect criticism, Tanaka immediately realised that Midway necessitated a substantial enlargement of the defensive perimeter. More important, Tanaka correctly divined that capturing Midway represented Combined Fleet's first step toward an eventual operation aimed at Hawaii. He was strongly opposed to both notions, even going so far as to declare that an Hawaiian invasion would undermine the Empire's entire war effort. In the end, Tanaka flatly refused to contribute troops to either Midway or the Aleutians. Despite this rather sharp dismissal, Tomioka had little choice but to proceed with the wholesale gulping down of Yamamoto's plans, culminating in his penning a naval staff document entitled Imperial Navy Operational Plans for Stage 2 of the Great East Asia War. Within its pages, the notion of an operation aimed at the Indian Ocean was officially relegated to secondary status. An advance against Fiji and Samoa was dropped altogether, although only for the moment, as we shall see. In lieu of army forces, naval landing troops would be employed against Midway. After the seizure of Midway, Johnston and Palmyra would be taken, setting up an invasion of Hawaii. Despite Tanaka's rebuff, the Navy's plan optimistically anticipated that this operation would be launched in cooperation with the Army. It was this plan that Admiral Nagano personally submitted to the Emperor on 16th of April. Also present was General Sugiyama Gen, the Army's Chief of Staff, who raised no objections. Perhaps he was waiting for a more opportune time to make the Army's counter-arguments. As events were to prove, though, this was the Army's last opportunity to stop the forthcoming operation. Just two days after the audience with the Emperor, the Americans would seal Yamamoto's political victory. To all outward appearances, during the first four months of 1942, the Americans were losing the war in the Pacific in a truly spectacular fashion. The raid on Pearl Harbor had shaken the self-confidence of the US Navy to its foundations. America's battleship force, the core of its naval power for decades, had been crippled at the outset, meaning that there was no hope of defending the Philippines when the Japanese simultaneously launched operations there. Nor could it do more than offer token forces to the defence of Java and Sumatra, 
The Americans were forced to watch as the Japanese offensive unfolded with a speed and precision that no one had thought possible. If the US Navy's material losses had been in absolute terms marginal to its overall strength, the blows to its pride had been real enough. By April, the strategic position of the Allies in the Pacific had been reduced to a shambles. Java and Sumatra had fallen, with almost the entire US Asiatic squadron destroyed in the process. The Japanese were now in a position to threaten Australia directly. The Philippines were completely isolated, and the bulk of General Douglas MacArthur's forces there, though gallant, would surrender on 9th of April. Malaya and Burma had fallen under the aggressor's boot, and the British would shortly find India directly threatened as well. The picture was one of utter calamity. However, the disasters of the previous four months had resulted in several key realisations on the part of the Americans. First, it was clear that the battleship was no longer a weapon of decision. If the war was to be won, America would have to rely on aircraft carriers for power projection and submarines for destruction of enemy shipping. For the US Navy, this was a simple matter of finding virtue in necessity. The preservation and augmentation of its carriers and the destruction of the enemies were the overriding goals of the US Navy from the time the smoke cleared over Pearl Harbor. Second, if a successful defence against the Japanese was to be made, it would hinge primarily on the abilities of the US military. The tiny Dutch forces had been annihilated. More important, British strength had evaporated to the point that the Royal Navy was in no position to leave the Indian Ocean, even in direct defence of Australia and New Zealand. This was a shocking state of affairs, but the weakness of Britain's position was plain for all to see. For their part, Australia and New Zealand, though possessed of first-rate militaries, had neither the population nor the economic basis to guarantee their own defence, let alone carry the war to Japan. If the war in the Pacific was to be won, the United States would have to shoulder the majority of the burden. Third, in light of these considerations, it was vital that the Americans immediately guarantee the security of those Pacific bases that were essential to the long-term prosecution of the war. In an immediate sense, these were Pearl Harbour and the Panama Canal. The loss of either would have been catastrophic. The Panama Canal was so remote that its outright capture was almost inconceivable, and hence it required little garrisoning. Hawaii was quite another matter, however, and the Americans moved quickly after 7th of December to beef up Oahu's defences, as well as those at outlying bases such as Johnston Island and Midway. By April of 1942, the garrison in Hawaii had already increased to nearly 70,000 combatants, up from about 30,000 in October 1941, and was projected to grow to 115,000 in short order. If not absolutely guaranteeing the security of the islands, the size of the American garrison certainly presented the Japanese with formidable obstacles to conquest. However, by the same token, if the United States was ultimately to be successful in carrying the war to the enemy, Australia had to be defended as well. By February, the Japanese were already threatening its northern frontiers. Worse yet, several of the Aussies' splendid infantry divisions were still deployed in the Middle East with the British Army. At this critical juncture, President Franklin D. Roosevelt had personally assured Australia's Prime Minister John Curtin that at least one division of American troops, and perhaps more, would be sent to ensure Australia's security. Such a promise was logical, but it generated additional requirements beyond the direct commitment of American forces. To support ground troops, it would also be necessary to defend the communications lines to Australia. This meant that several important island groups, including the Fijis, New Caledonia and Samoa, would need to be fortified more strongly. The Australian and New Zealand garrisons already in these areas were pitifully understrength. Accordingly, the Americans lost little time in scrambling to send substantial combat Plus, contingents the Americans, to these in short order, hospitals. found themselves moving regiments and divisions to places that many US officers wouldn't have been able to find on a map just six months earlier. This led directly to the fourth American realisation, 
If the Pacific was to be defended, the notion of a Germany first strategy had to be flexible enough to accommodate the immediate needs of the Pacific. In practical terms, this meant that the prevailing notion of an invasion of the European continent as early as mid-1942 had to be put on ice. In hindsight, attacking Germany directly in 1942 was completely unrealistic in any case. Nevertheless, this temporary reordering of military priorities in favour of the Pacific represented a dramatic modification of pre-war strategy. The man upon whom command in the Pacific fell was Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet. Nimitz had taken charge on 31st of December 1941 after the disgraced Admiral Husband E. Kimmel had been relieved following the attack on Pearl Harbour. Nimitz was by all accounts an excellent officer. Instead of sacking Kimmel's staff, his first act was to retain them amid assurances of his utter confidence in their abilities. This had the effect of steadying the morale of a command that had been badly shaken. Likewise, the new commander-in-chief was a sound judge of men, knowing who to promote and who to lateral into positions that better fit their abilities. He delegated authority easily and knew how to get the best out of his subordinates. Level-headed, Nimitz was apparently immune to panic and retained at all times a shrewd ability to assess odds and likely outcomes. His calculating nature was complemented, though, with boldness and an aggressive spirit. Nimitz was determined to destroy the main force of the Japanese Navy as soon as was practical, and he knew that his carriers would be the centrepiece of any such action. Even in the face of the near hysteria of the early war months, when the exploits of Japan's warriors had given them the aura of invincibility, Nimitz was confident that his sailors and aviators were fully the equal of their opponents. For the moment, though, Nimitz had little choice but to react to Japanese moves. He did not yet have anything resembling the material preponderance that he would need to win the war. He was outnumbered in fleet carriers, the Saratoga having been heavily damaged in January by an enemy submarine. The newer but smaller Wasp was still in the Atlantic. This left four carriers, Saratoga's sister ship, Lexington and the Enterprise, Yorktown and their newly commissioned sisters, Hip, Hornet, which had just reached the Pacific in March. Throughout the first months of the war, Nimitz gamely employed his carriers in a series of raids against exposed enemy outposts. Although these minor actions had little material impact on the war, they did have the positive effect of hardening the American carrier air groups. However, by April, reacting to pressure from Washington that the Navy do something positive to boost the morale of the American public, Two of Nimitz's carriers participated in a far more audacious carrier raid, one that ultimately produced outsized results. On the morning of 18th of April, just two days after Admiral Nagano had presented the midway plan to the Emperor, 16 American twin-engined medium bombers appeared as if by magic over Tokyo and half a dozen other cities. Commanded by Army Air Force Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, these aircraft had been launched some 400 miles off of the Japanese coastline by the carrier Hornet. She, along with her consort Enterprise, had penetrated the Japanese defensive lines in much the same way that Japan had opened the war against the United States by traversing the desolate wastes of the Northern Pacific. Given the scarcity of carriers, Admiral Nimitz had been reluctant to authorise such an operation. But he had no choice but to comply with his superior's wishes and ordered the newly arrived Hornet to participate. At Alameda Air Station in California, Hornet had duly stowed Doolittle's B-25s on the after end of her flight deck and then set off directly across the Pacific for what the majority of her sailors thought was an aircraft ferrying mission. It was only after being joined by Vice Admiral William F. Halsey Jr.'s Enterprise in mid-ocean that the nature of the mission was fully revealed. Such a raid had not been unanticipated by the Imperial Navy. Ugaki had remarked on the danger of such attacks in his diary as early as 2 February 1942. To safeguard against these threats, the Japanese had placed a ring of picket boats 700 miles off the shore of the home islands to detect the approach of enemy task forces. 
A pair of these sentinels had, in fact, sighted the American task force in time to warn Tokyo before being sunk by the Americans. However, the Japanese had not anticipated the American innovation of using longer-ranged army bombers launched from a carrier. Normally, an enemy flattop would have been obligated to close to within about 200 miles, the extreme range of US carrier-based aircraft, in order to attack. Upon being sighted, however, the Americans had simply let fly with their B-25s and then promptly headed for the exits. The Imperial Navy tried to redeem the situation. Coincidentally, Nagumo and his five carriers were making their way back to Japan from their raids against Ceylon, when Doolittle attacked, and Akagi, SRIE and Hairi were sent charging eastward from Mako, Taiwan, in pursuit of the American flattops. But the Americans were not waiting around to receive Japanese retribution for their insolence. Akagi and company had found nothing but empty ocean and were obliged to return to Hashirajima empty-handed. Strictly speaking, the military results of the Doolittle raid were so minimal as to be laughable. A few bombs sprinkled in desultory fashion over various targets and the light carrier, Ryuho slightly damaged on the building ways in Yokosuka. But the psychological impact of the attack was enormous. Admiral Nagano, having personally heard the explosions in Tokyo, reacted to news of the attack with stunned disbelief, muttering, This shouldn't happen. This just should not happen. Yamamoto took ill and retreated to his cabin for an entire day. Like all the Navy's upper command, he felt a deep obligation to safeguard the nation from attack. More particularly, the thought that the Emperor had been personally endangered filled Yamamoto with an unquenchable remorse. He knew, and his peers knew, that such a raid could never have materialised if the American carriers had been sunk outright in Hawaii at the beginning of the war. The fact that not a single American plane had been brought down by Japanese defences only made the whole episode even more mortifying. This American pinprick had the effect of cementing the strategic debate in favour of Yamamoto and winning the army over regarding operations in the Central Pacific. Until the American carriers were safely in their graves, the homeland could never be completely protected from their attacks. After April 18th, their destruction had been raised to the status of an axiomatic good. The day after Doolittle's raid, General Tanaka privately told Captain Tomioka that he was rethinking his reservations regarding Operation MI. On the 20th, Tanaka not only formally approved of Operation MI, but also committed the army to supplying troops for the assault. Even more intriguing, he informally asked Tomioka for more details on Eastern Operation, which marked something of a watershed in the army's appreciation for the scheme. The army initially assented to Operation MI on the explicit understanding that it not be dragged into operations aimed at Hawaii. However, within a month, the army had done an about-face on this matter too. On 25th of May, just days before the Nagumo force was slated to sail for Midway, the army issued orders to several units to begin preparing for an amphibious attack against Hawaii. Training for the assault was to be completed by the end of September. Thus, against great odds, Yamamoto had achieved his goal operations in the Central Pacific, aimed at the destruction of the American fleet and the subsequent capture of Hawaii. It is necessary now to turn to an examination of Yamamoto's operational plan as it emerged in its final form, a task for which the reader would be well advised to pour a rather tall glass of spirits beforehand. The first order of business involves clarifying the exact relationship between the operations aimed at the Aleutians, AL, and those centred on Midway, MI. Western accounts of the battle have generally characterised Operational AL as being an elaborate diversion in support of Operation MI. According to this interpretation, AL was designed to lure the US fleet out of Pearl Harbour such that it could be intercepted and engaged north of Hawaii as it moved to relieve the Aleutians. However, this rendering of Japanese intentions is incorrect. In fact, Operation AL was an entirely separate endeavour that was never designed to impact the conduct of operations around Midway. The debunking of the diversion myth is supported by numerous Japanese sources. 
Prominent among these are a pair of monographs prepared by Japanese naval officers for the military history section of U.S. Army forces Far East immediately after the war. According to one of these reports, the April 5th compromise between Nagano and Yamamoto led to a revision of the operational plan to allow for conducting the Midway and Aleutian invasions simultaneously in early June, emphasis added. The second monograph confirms that Operation MI was to be carried out nearly simultaneously with the Aleutians' operation. In neither of these monographs is mention made of Operation AL being a feint or diversion to be launched before Operation MI, or of its being intended to draw the Americans north out of Pearl Harbor. It's worth noting, too, that the main battleship groups for the two operations, Yamamoto's main body and Takasu's guard force, sorted together from Hashirajima and simply diverged thereafter. Admiral Nagumo's official report on the battle similarly makes no mention of the Aleutians' operations being a diversion. Indeed, it doesn't describe the Aleutians as being related to the action off Midway in any way whatsoever. Similarly, the post-war interview of Commander Watanabe Yasuji Yamamoto's staff officer is completely silent on the topic. One would have supposed that such a prominent feature of the plan would have been pointed out by Watanabe, making this omission curious indeed. The interview of Admiral Nagano as well, despite Nagano's spurious disavowal of his staff's role in creating the Aleutian's operational concept, makes no mention of AL being a diversion. Watanabe and Nagano, of course, were both present at the 2-5 April staff discussions that led to Operation AL's incorporation into the overall battle plan, and were clearly in a position to have pointed out this facet of the operations. The second objection to be raised is simply one of common sense. For a diversion to have lured the Americans from Pearl Harbor, an attack in the Aleutians would have needed to take place not one, but several days before the Japanese showed their hand at Midway. This was absolutely necessary in order to give the US fleet time to react to the perceived threat and begin steaming north to the Aleutians. Even had they responded quickly on only a day's notice, the Americans would still have been well south of Midway when Nagumo attacked. Indeed, as will be shown, Yamamoto never considered that the enemy would move directly north toward the Aleutians. Rather, he envisioned US forces sailing west from Oahu and then giving battle to the southwest of Midway. This was hardly the course of action one would expect of a force being deliberately lured toward the Aleutians. The final piece of the puzzle is to be found in the Japanese official war history. In its final form, Yamamoto's plans all fundamentally revolved around N-Day, 7 June, Tokyo time, 6 June local, when Midway was to be invaded and captured. As mentioned, offensive operations would open several days beforehand, on day N-3, 4 June Tokyo, 3 June local. On this day, as set forth in the original Japanese plan of operations, Dutch Harbour and Midway were both to have been attacked. Indeed, this was the plan up until shortly before Nagumo actually sailed. Thus, the idea of the Aleutians being a feint is clearly untrue. For the most part, Operation AL was simply an expedient land grab to be executed while the US Pacific Fleet was busy elsewhere. Its goal was to push Japan's defensive perimeter outward. More precisely, AL's object was to capture or demolish points of strategical sick value on the western Aleutian Islands in order to check the enemy's air and ship manoeuvres in this area. By doing so, air and surface patrols would provide a perfect shielding opportunity for Japan. Potential incursion from the north and communication links between the United States and Russia would then be obstructed. This latter was a very important point given the quantity of American supplies being sent to Russia via the Barents Sea. Furthermore, Japanese possession of the Aleutians was conceived as a flanking movement to protect. Midway from a possible attack from the north, once the island was secured. It is clear from the foregoing that the Japanese held an exaggerated opinion of the utility of the Aleutians as a possible path for launching either an invasion or strategic bombing attacks against the homeland.
The weather conditions in the Aleutians, as the Japanese were shortly to discover, were routinely awful. The islands themselves, small, mountainous, and devoid of any ground cover or building materials, made the archipelago useless for staging any offensive action larger than an occasional narwhal hunt. Yet, such were the defensive goals with which the Japanese went forth. The second major clarification regarding AL regards how it was to unfold. Despite being almost a sideshow in comparison to the operations off Midway, Operation AL's order of battle was perhaps more complex than that of Operation MI. Yamamoto's plan considered three distinct phases of operation, each of which anticipated major reshufflings of the naval formations involved. This has the effect of greatly complicating any discussion of the anticipated movements of warships during the operation. The three phases, known as distributions, were detailed in Northern Naval Force Order No. 24, issued on 20th of May. Their goals and timing were as follows. The first distribution encompassed the initial approach to the objective and operations up to the point where the immediate landing objectives were achieved, i.e. approximately 8th of June 1942. The second distribution pertained to operations designed to consolidate Japan's hold on the area and would continue until such time as the threat of counterattack by the enemy had been largely nullified. The third distribution defined reallocation of ships to guard the northern area. This was to be in effect by 20th of June 1942. The three distributions and their effects on the forces assigned to Operation AL are described in tabular format in Appendix 11. Yamamoto envisioned opening Operation AL with an attack on Dutch Harbour on 4th June, three days before the planned invasion of Midway itself. This would nullify American naval and air power at their only major base proximate to the western end of the Aleutians archipelago. Attacks would continue as needed, followed by landings on the islands of Kiska and Adak on the 6th. An optional landing on Attu was scheduled for the 12th. The landing at Adak was to be temporary, lasting only as long as it took to destroy the American facilities that were feared to be there. Although the capture of Dutch Harbour was not contemplated at this time, the Japanese felt it was important to secure bases from which patrols could be mounted against it. Doing so would forestall the feared development of Dutch Harbour as an air and submarine base that threatened the North Pacific. To accomplish these aims, an army force of 1,143 troops was slated to land on Attu and Adak, carried by a single transport. Guarding it would be light cruiser Abukuma, four destroyers and a mine layer. Meanwhile, Kiska would be assaulted by 550 troops from the Navy's Maizuru 3rd Special Pioneer Force, known in the West as Special Naval Landing Forces, or SNLF, accompanied by a construction battalion. The Navy troops were to be carried in two transports guarded by the light cruisers Kiso and Tama and three destroyers, accompanied by an armed merchant cruiser and three minesweepers. Overall command of the Aleutians operation was to be vested in Vice Admiral Hosogaya Moshiro's northern force main body, which during the first distribution would consist of heavy cruiser Nachi, two destroyers, two oilers and three supply ships. Also under Hosogaya's control was Rear Admiral Yamazaki Shigeaki's force of six submarines, which were to scout ahead of the landing forces and screen the surface forces behind them. The real stricken power of the Aleutians Operation was centred on Rear Admiral Kakuta Kakuji's second mobile stricken force. Dainikid Butai bore a little resemblance to its more illustrious cousin. It consisted of Carrier Division 4, hereafter Cardiff 4, composed of the converted carrier Junyo, which had just been commissioned, and the light carrier Ryujo. They were an odd pair. Junyo was larger and had better aircraft handling facilities, but she was hampered by her low speed of 25 knots. This meant that she was not considered capable of operating torpedo aircraft, because in light wind conditions she wasn't fast enough to create the relative wind over her bow necessary to launch them. Kakuta's flagship, Ryujo, was faster, but she was plagued by small elevators, meaning that she could not operate the burly Type 99 dive bomber. Thus, 
neither of these ships was as useful as a true fleet carrier alone, and they were only marginally more useful in tandem. Kakuta's command was filled out by heavy cruisers, Takao and Maya, three destroyers, and an oiler. A small independent seaplane force, composed of the seaplane tender Kimikawa Maru and a destroyer, was responsible for cooperating with the landing operations, as well as locating enemy ships. In a similar vein, the 22nd Picket Boat Squadron would provide a defensive perimeter around the operation. The Aleutians Base Air Force, consisting of four transports and six large Type 97 flying boats from the Toko Air Group, would provide scouting support. In distant support of Kakuta's force was the Aleutians Screening Force under Vice Admiral Takasu Shiro, who hoisted his flag on battleship Huga. The core of his force was Bat Div 2, composed of Huga's sister ship, Isa, and the dowager battleships Fuso and Yamashiro. These were the four oldest battle wagons in Japan's inventory, and were roughly equivalent to the aged American battleships sunk at Pearl Harbor. Screening these heavy units were light cruisers Kitakami and Oi and twelve destroyers. Two oilers accompanied them. However, Takasu's dreadnoughts were not officially part of Operation AL, and were only mentioned tangentially in the original Japanese planning documents. They would sail with Yamamoto's main body, and thereafter place themselves in a position to provide support to the Aleutians' forces if events warranted. Once the Aleutians were captured, the second distribution would bring about a large-scale reshuffling of Japan's warships. The Atuadak and Kiska invasion force would be dissolved and its vessels incorporated into other formations, notably the main body. This beefed-up unit would be retained for support of the entire Aleutian operation. Meanwhile, Kakuta's second mobile striking force would be augmented by light carrier Zoiho and a quartet of destroyers drawn from the various midway forces. Kakuta's goal remained the same, the annihilation of any American vessels encountered. In support of this, the submarine force would be more than doubled by the addition of another seven boats that had been under maintenance in Japan at the time the operational orders were issued, 20 May. The seaplane group, reinforced with Kamikawa Maru, again drawn from the Midway forces, would continue its scouting mission, as would the base air force. On both Kiska and Atu, the land forces would begin deploying for defence. The third distribution anticipated yet another major reshuffling, aimed at the long-term defence of the newly won territories. The main body would be reduced, though its support-oriented mission would remain. Two new support formations would be formed, each centred on a pair of fast battleships from the Bat Div 3 and augmented by heavy cruisers and destroyers, in many cases newly released from the forces clustered around Midway. At the same time, Kakuta's second mobile striking force would be heavily reinforced and divided into two separate raiding groups. The first group would essentially consist of the forces he had begun the battle with Cardiff 4 and their escorts. Meanwhile, Zuiho would be split off into the second raiding group, joined by the Zuikaku, which was expected to be ready for operations by this time. Both raiding groups were to be under Kakuta's overall command. However, no specific missions for either group were defined, and it is difficult to see what these forces would have been able to accomplish in such latitudes. Operation AL's three distributions ultimately expected to call on the services of more than 80 vessels at one time or another, including eight battleships out of the Imperial Navy's inventory of 11, four of her 11 carriers, and 13 submarines. By itself, the Aleutians' plan represented a larger commitment of forces than any operation the Japanese had embarked on thus far in the war. Far from being a sideshow, AL actually represented a sizeable drain on the Imperial Navy's already scarce resources. It is interesting to note that nowhere in the Aleutians' battle plan was there apparently any provision for Kakuta's second striking force to be in any position to support Nagumo's operations to the south after its initial attacks against Dutch Harbour were concluded. If anything, the flow of forces was in reverse, in that many of the vessels slated for inclusion in AL's later phases were to come directly from the Midway forces. Indeed, some of them, including four destroyers from Nagumo's own screen, 
were scheduled to arrive soon after 8th of June. Presumably these vessels would be detached and head northward immediately after the conclusion of operations in the vicinity of Midway. All in all, Operation AL reflected the larger problems inherent in Yamamoto's battle plan. It anticipated using widely separated forces and putting a great number of warships into northern waters, many of which weren't accomplishing anything terribly important. At the same time, AL's force structure for its later distributions actually anticipated siphoning off units that were being used near Midway, which was ostensibly the centre of strategic gravity in the entire Pacific Ocean. These requirements directly contributed to the clockwork rigidity of the planning for Operation MI itself. It is difficult to escape the conclusion that all the time and energy that went into Operation AL might have been better spent focusing on operations to the south. Operation AL's flaws, though, paled in comparison to the errors Yamamoto would commit in his schemes aimed at Midway. Operation MI would begin at the same time that Kakuta opened his attacks on Dutch Harbour. N3 day, 4th June Tokyo time, 3rd June local. Nagumo's force six fleet carriers, Cardivs 1, 2 and 5, two fast battleships from Bat Div 3, two heavy cruisers and 11 destroyers with their light cruiser flotilla leader would approach midway from the northwest. On the morning of the 4th, Tokyo time, Daiichi Kid Butai would be in position to strike. It was believed that a single attack would be sufficient to destroy the American airbase and its aircraft. The Japanese presumed that they would have the element of strategic and tactical surprise on their side, because offensive activities would be opened concurrently with Operation AL. Thus, Nagumo's carriers would simply sweep in unannounced and deliver a death blow against American air power on the island. Day N2, 5-4 June, would see additional airstrikes, with the Japanese turning their attention toward reducing the island's defences in preparation for the coming amphibious operation. While it was understood that Nagumo would have to deal with any American carriers that ventured north from Pearl Harbour to contest the Midway invasion, it was anticipated that the Americans would not be able to steam the distance between Hawaii and Midway in any less than three days. This being the case, Nagumo would only have to attend to one thing at a time. Nagumo's force would also use 10 of its Type 97 carrier attack planes for scouting purposes. Each of these aircraft would search out to a range of 400 miles to help provide early warning of the American fleet. Ground operations would begin on the morning of N1 day, 6-5 June. The Japanese would land on Cure Island, a tiny islet 60 miles west of Midway. Rear Admiral Fujita Ryutaro's seaplane tender group would secure this objective with a small contingent of troops. It was then to be put into operation as a seaplane base for use against Midway itself. On the morning of end day, 7-6 June, Midway would be assaulted by a mixed group of both Navy and Army units. The landing would be carried out by barge, known in the Imperial Navy as Daihatsu each of which could carry about a hundred soldiers as far as the reef. From there, the men would have to wade the remaining 200 or more yards through the lagoon and onto the beaches by foot. The Navy's second combined SNLF, consisting of some 1,500 soldiers, would be landed on Sand Island. Eastern Island would be invaded by the 1,000 men of Colonel Ichiki Kionao's regiment, named the Ichiki Detachment after its commander. Both forces would be landed on the southern shores of the islands, where the reef was less of an obstacle to amphibious movements. An additional landing on Sand Island's northwest corner was also planned if necessary. Accompanying the combat troops were two construction battalions, some of which were equipped with American construction material captured at Wake Island, and other auxiliary personnel necessary to repair Midway and turn it into a frontline airbase, bringing the total ground forces to over 5,000. The transports would also be hauling along 94 cannon, 40 machine guns, 6 Type A midget submarines, 5 motor torpedo boats, and all the accoutrements to develop Midway into a major outpost. Additional midget submarines, as well as land-based torpedo tubes and a dozen 20 cm guns, were slated for delivery in mid-June.
In a fashion that was typical of Japan's inter-service cooperation, the army troops would sail separately from Yokosuka, while the SNLF troops would sail from Kure. Both the army and navy had their own separate transports, and neither service was willing to accommodate the other aboard their own ships. Both private fleets would rendezvous at Saipan, and thereafter would sail together under the command of Rear Admiral Tanaka Raizo's transport group. This force consisted of the light cruiser Jinsu, ten destroyers, three patrol boats, twelve transports, and several oilers. In relative proximity to Tanaka would sail Vice Admiral Kurita Takeo's close support group, which was centred on the four powerful heavy cruisers of Crudiv 7 Kumano, Suzuya, Mikuma, and Mogami. This quartet's 48-inch guns were to provide fire support for the landing. However, the Imperial Navy's raison d'etre was engaging enemy warships, not supporting landings. The Navy had never spent much time developing any sort of formal approach for spotting and coordinating gunfire ashore for troops. In hindsight, there is a very real question as to how effective Crew Div 7 would have proved to be in this role had it actually been put to the test. Kurita was accompanied by two destroyers and an oiler. Also near to hand, but sailing separately, was a minesweeper group consisting of three minesweepers, three subchasers, and an ammunition ship. Somewhat farther away would be the invasion force main body, under the command of Vice Admiral Kondo Nobuteke. It consisted of the other two members of Bat Div 3 Hie and Congo under Rear Admiral Mikawa Gunichi. Four heavy cruisers, Otago, Chokai, Haguro and Miyoko also accompanied the force. The screen for this powerful unit was commanded by Rear Admiral Nishimura Shoji aboard the light cruiser Yura, which led seven destroyers. Also included in this group was the fine new light carrier Zuiho and her plane guard destroyer. All three of these formations, Tanakas, Kondos and Kuritas, were to approach Midway from the west-southwest. Midway was scheduled for capture on the 6th, local time, leaving a day for the base to be put back into operation in advance of the expected sea battle with the Americans. During this time, Nagumo's carriers would be supporting the invasion and simultaneously moving to the northeast of the island in preparation for the naval battle. His force was expected to be in position to support Kondo from the north-northwest by the end of the 6th. Kondo, for his part, would keep his battleships ready to deliver backup fire support against Midway if stiff resistance was encountered. The backstop to both Kondo's and Nagumo's forces was Yamamoto himself and his main body. Centred on Bat-Div 1 Yamato, Nagato and Mutsu this force contained the largest guns in the fleet. It was to follow behind Nagumo during the initial phase of the operation. Within this force would be several smaller formations that could manoeuvre independently if need be. One of them, the special group, consisting of seaplane tenders Chioda and Nishin, which were carrying midget submarines and motor torpedo boats, respectively, to reinforce Midway once it was captured. The second special formation, the carrier group, consisted of the ancient light carrier Hosho. Around all of the elements of the main force would be Rear Admiral Hashimoto Shintaro's screening force, consisting of light cruiser Sendai and eight destroyers. Three oilers accompanied the group. Once Midway was secured, the main body would be in position to support Kondo should the need arise. It was strongly believed that after six months of war, the Americans were now sufficiently weakened and demoralised that they would only sortie from Pearl Harbour with some coaxing. Kondo was the bait. Among other things, his flotilla contained a pair of capital ships, Hie and Congo, which made it a force worth attacking. At the same time, his two battleships were fast enough to extricate themselves from trouble if need be. Yamamoto apparently did not want to tip his hand by revealing his main body too soon, in the belief that such a massive array of firepower would induce the Americans to stay home. In other words, Yamamoto's dispersal of forces was purely an attempt at deception. His killing force would not enter scouting range of Midway until after the Americans had themselves sorted from Pearl.
In a way, his plan was almost reminiscent of the usage of cruiser forces by both the German High Seas Fleet and the Royal Navy in World War I to lure the enemy into range of the main battle squadrons. Not surprisingly, having current intelligence on the American units that would presumably be walking into the trap was crucial to the operation's success. Yamamoto would be aided in these efforts by a special mission designed to assess the status of the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. Referred to as Operation K, the Japanese would employ flying boats operating out of the islands of Jaluit and Watcha to overfly the American fleet base on 31st of May, just before the commencement of the fleet actions. Kawanishi Type II four-engined flying boats had performed this same mission twice before in early March. On the first occasion, a heavy overcast on 3 per 4 of March had made reconnaissance impossible. During the second, on 9 to 10 of March, American fighters from Midway had intercepted and destroyed the Japanese plane. Yet, despite the negative results from these two missions, not to mention the evidence that this particular gimmick might be wearing a bit thin, Yamamoto didn't waver from trying a third time. The catch to Operation K was that no Japanese aircraft, even the big Kawanishis, had the range to fly all the way to Pearl Harbor and back without refueling. A flying boat, however, could make good this deficiency by stopping at some secluded place along the way to refuel. The chosen stopover had been an uninhabited islet known as French Frigate Shoals, which lay between Midway and Hawaii. In March, the Navy had used a submarine there to refuel the Kawanishis, which then proceeded to Hawaii. The same approach was to be used again on 31st May. In addition to aerial reconnaissance, two picket lines of submarines would be positioned across the presumed line of advance of the Americans. The southern cordon, A, and northern cordon, B, were each composed of seven fleet boats. However, the submarines of both groups were assigned fixed positions, rather than being placed in patrol boxes in which they could operate freely. Worse, the patrol lines did not have overlapping fields of vision, making them porous indeed. This static mode of employment, which was typical of Japanese submarine operations throughout the war, meant that the big Imperial Navy boats could not be concentrated on enemy units with anything like the flexibility that the Germans were currently employing in the Atlantic. The decisive battle, as Yamamoto envisioned it, would be fought somewhere off Midway, with the main Japanese forces arrayed so as to intercept the oncoming Americans. After pounding Midway, Nagumo would withdraw and wait some 500 miles north-northeast of Midway with Yamamoto's main body supporting him 300 miles to the west. Takasu's battleship force would come down from its position in the North Pacific to hover 500 miles north of Yamamoto. Second mobile striking force, with its two carriers, would perform a similar manoeuvre to position itself 300 miles to the east of Takasu. Kondo's force would supply the bait to draw the Americans out of hiding at Pearl Harbour and lure them north with the Japanese heavy forces lurking out of range of American reconnaissance aircraft and submarines. If all went according to plan, the Americans would appear off midway after the landings had taken place. Yamamoto presumed that the Americans would sortie west from Oahu and then head north so as to be able to ambush the exposed Kondo as he trailed his coat near the island. Interestingly, it appears that Combined Fleet's opinion was that the Americans would bring not only their carriers, but also their few remaining battleships to the fray. It was further assumed that the carriers would operate separately from their battleship-centric main body, screening them from the west-northwest. This was a fairly doctrinaire interpretation of how the Americans would manoeuvre their forces, with the carriers presumably governed by the movements of the slower battleship force operating in the rear. In other words, it assumed that the Americans thought their battle squadrons were capable of making a meaningful contribution to a modern carrier battle, as Yamamoto believed his own could. In this, the Japanese were projecting their own beliefs on their opponent, a classic failing of many military plans. Having manufactured roles for their own battleships, the Japanese believed that the enemy would do likewise. <laughs>
However, what the Japanese couldn't know was that the Americans had by now totally discarded the idea of using their older battle wagons in conjunction with fast carriers. Yamamoto had only himself to blame for this radical transformation of American naval thought, as his triumph at Pearl Harbor had demonstrated unequivocally to his enemies the total vulnerability of such forces in the face of modern air power. Once the Americans were detected, Takasu's battle group would move south to join Yamamoto. On the eastern flank, Nagumo would move south to engage the American fleet as well. It was expected that attrition from the submarines, coupled with airstrikes from the carriers, would weaken the Americans sufficiently that they could be engaged and annihilated by the Japanese battleships. In a sense, Yamamoto's plan represented a curious reversion to a more gunpowder-oriented philosophy, relegating Nagumo's carriers to an attritional role on par with the submarine force. Taken together, Operations AL and MI represented the commitment of almost the entirety of the Imperial Japanese Navy, all of its carriers, all of its battleships, all but four of its heavy cruisers, and the bulk of its lesser combatants. Twenty-eight admirals would lead these forces into battle, and they would log more miles and consume more fuel in this single operation than was normally used in an entire year. It was planned that once the battle was won, Nagumo's carriers would retire to Truk between 16 and 20 the June. The battleships would return to home waters or head north to assist Operation AL. Thereafter, operations would be launched to consolidate the fruits of victory. Truk would be the jumping-off location for further planned incursions into the southwest Pacific, with New Caledonia, Fiji and Samoa slated for occupation in July. In other words, in the interval between 5th of April, when Admiral Nagano had acceded to Yamamoto's plans and the southwest Pacific had been ostensibly removed from consideration, and early May, when the detailed battle plan was to be wargamed, Naval GHQ's preferred strategic option had once again been reintegrated into the Navy's overall strategic plan, albeit as a follow-on operation. August was to see the occupation of Johnston Island, as well as the first invasions of the Australian landmass itself. Last to go would be Hawaii, now shorn of any sort of mobile support, and increasingly isolated by Japanese outposts. It was a breathtaking vision indeed, yet its grandeur was betrayed by fundamental flaws in planning. Readers may be pardoned at this juncture if they are somewhat dizzied by the array of geographic objectives, formations, admirals and ships that paraded through the schemes for operations AL and MI. Indeed, this is the first and most obvious drawback to the plan drafted by Kuroshima and ratified by Yamamoto. It was almost incomprehensibly complex. More than a dozen different surface formations and numerous groups of submarines were expected to participate in this tightly scripted operation. However, the expectation that these formations could coordinate their actions in such a fashion was ill-founded. Byzantine intricacy was a trademark of pre-war Japanese naval strategy. Fleet exercises often featured exquisitely coordinated manoeuvres on the part of the Imperial Navy being met with conveniently inept counter-moves by the oafish Americans, who never failed to go lowing obediently to their choreographed slaughter. Yamamoto, far from having steered his way clear of this strategic dreamland, had instead erected a monument to it. He concocted a plan that dissipated his own superiority of numbers, such that the essential core of the operation, the neutralisation of Midway, was to be performed by a mere 22 warships. This was about a tenth of the total number of vessels he envisioned scattering across the breadth of the Pacific in pursuit of various objectives, many of which were completely irrelevant to the success or failure of the centrepiece of the plan. The Aleutians' operation stands at the top of this list of frivolous goals. By anyone's measure, the reduction of Dutch harbour was a poor excuse to send the 50-odd warships of the first distribution to the North Pacific. In light of the fact that Operation AL was not even intended as a feint, it is difficult to understand devoting any resources to such a strategic irrelevancy. If the American carriers were destroyed off of Midway, then the Aleutians could be captured at will, 
If Nagumo failed, however, then in the long run the Aleutians could not be defended even if captured. As it developed, Atu and Kiska were to be the trifling consolation prizes for the failure of Operation MI. Their loss meant almost nothing to the Americans. Indeed, when he was informed of Atu's fall after the Battle of Midway had already transpired, US Navy Secretary W. Frank Knox offered a pithy indictment of Yamamoto's plan by remarking that Japan was either unable to understand modern war or not qualified to take part in it. It must be emphasised that blame for this strategic faux pas must be shared by not only Yamamoto, but by naval GHQ as well. It was GHQ that appended the Aleutians' concept to Yamamoto's offensive as the price for his ill-won gains in the realm of planning prerogative. If Yamamoto's downstream planning was flawed, Admiral Nagano and company had only themselves to blame for demanding that he throw good assets at a fundamentally bad idea. Yamamoto, though, apparently didn't put up much of a fuss at the notion, such was his confidence in his ability to beat the Americans. The larger issue of dispersal of Japan's forces, of which Operation AL was only a symptom has, of course, been minutely examined in earlier histories of the battle. Certain points bear repeating here, though. As was mentioned, the prevailing opinion within Combined Fleet, and a belief that Yamamoto apparently shared, was that the American fleet was a beaten, demoralised outfit that would need to be coaxed toward its own annihilation. The corollary to this was that the need for deception outweighed the need for placing forces where they could be mutually supporting. Only by using deception would Yamamoto be able to bring his array of warships to battle without spooking the Americans into remaining in Hawaii. In this age of unquestioned American military hegemony, it is difficult to understand how any nation could have characterised the US Navy in such a fashion. Yet, it must be remembered that in 1942, Japan had only a very limited context for judging the character of America's fighting forces. Indeed, in Japan's two previous wars against the Chinese and Russians, it had been up to the Japanese to precipitate many of the naval. Encounters, despite being the underdog, the Imperial Navy was thus used to being the aggressor against reluctant opponents. The first four months of the Pacific conflict had confirmed certain aspects of this Japanese self-image. The Allies had been handed an unbroken string of defeats since the inception of hostilities. If their bravery was not in question, it was apparent to all that their equipment, doctrine and training were in many ways not equal to Japan's. And while American morale had never broken, there was no question that American military prowess to date had been somewhat lacking. Given the beating the US Navy had taken thus far, it was hardly surprising that the Japanese might have thought the Americans would be reluctant to fight them on the high seas. Faced with such a foe, Yamamoto might well have thought that he was emulating the ancient Chinese military sage Sun Tzu's ninth maxim concerning weaknesses and strengths. By making his dispositions subtle and insubstantial, the expert leaves no trace. Divinely mysterious, he is inaudible. Yamamoto would have been well advised to read ahead to the chapter's 13th maxim, which his opponent Nimitz would adroitly use to destroy him in the coming days. If I am able to determine the enemy's dispositions while at the same time I conceal my own, then I can concentrate and he must divide and if I concentrate while he divides, I can use my entire strength to attack a fraction of his. This points to the first in the catalogue of Yamamoto's flaws as a commander, his inability to correctly fathom the true nature of his enemy. He had already failed in this regard once before, at Pearl Harbour. There, his passion for disabling the American fleet with a swift strike at the outset of hostilities had blinded him to the fact that attacking Hawaii by surprise would guarantee the implacable hatred of America. Now, during the planning for Midway, he likewise failed to discern the moral character of the enemy and its willingness to fight. Had Yamamoto correctly gauged the will of his foe, he might have realised that what was called for was less subtlety and more in the way of brute strength. Yamamoto then compounded this error by creating unnecessary subsidiary missions within the overall battle plan.
one cannot fail to get the impression that many of the forces involved in both AL and MI seem to have been put there almost out of a simple desire to find something for them to do. In fact, this may not be far from the truth. Admiral Ugaki remarked in his diary on 3rd March that he feared that the morale of the main body is stale after a long stay in home waters. I have encouraged them, but we must engage in some operational action. Given this situation, Yamamoto may well have felt that make work was better than no work at all. Yet of the 11 battleships deployed, only the four fast battleships in Nagumo's and Hond's forces would actually be providing any real support to the crux of the operation. And as it developed, Kond's pair would never really be involved in any meaningful way. This left the seven remaining slower battle wagons to provide distant cover for other groups. This was neither the first nor last time that the notion of distant cover would rear its misshapen head in Japanese battle planning. Indeed, it plagued their operations throughout the war. As it turned out, distant too often meant non-existent, in that the forces meant to be covered were too remote to be succoured when needed. This had very nearly proven the Japanese undoing at the Battle of Java Sea in March, where a Japanese cruiser force supporting an invasion convoy had been caught out of position by an Allied squadron. Only the speediness of Japan's cruisers had saved the day, allowing them to make up time on their slower charges. Likewise, the same notion of distant cover was to cost them the services of the light carrier Shoho in the not-too-distant future. It would be tempting to point to the Aleutians Force main body as being another poster child for this concept. Hosogaya's anorexic formation, whose warships were outnumbered by non-combatant vessels, five to three, could barely fend off an attack on itself, let alone pull anyone else's bacon from the fire. However, it must be recalled that according to the first distribution of Operation AL, the main body was little more than a placeholder for a larger force that would come into being in the second distribution. Takasu's Alutian's screening force, centred on Bat Div 2, was perhaps a more appropriate target for this criticism. With the four oldest battleships in the Japanese inventory covering the two misfit carriers of Daini Kid Butai, Takasu's force could not by itself provide a credible threat to any American carrier task force that somehow ranged into northern waters. Nor, with a top speed of around 24 knots, could it run away quickly enough to save itself should the wolf show up at its own doorstep. Had he encountered American carriers, Takasu would have suffered the same fate as the Pearl Harbor battleships, the only difference being the greater depth and lower ambient temperature of their respective watery graves. Of course, it was Yamamoto's intention that they never be brought to battle in northern waters at all. The fact that Takasu's group was not even administratively attached to Operation AL in a formal manner reinforces this impression. It is difficult to understand why Yamamoto didn't simply put Takasu's battle wagons in the main body and have done with. As it was, Takasu was poorly positioned to unite with the main body when the main battle began. The fact that Takasu was hundreds of miles north necessarily limited Yamamoto's speed of reaction if and when the Americans were detected. Should the Americans deviate from their script, Yamamoto might be forced to go into battle without Bat Div 2's gunpower. By standing equidistant between two friendly forces, Takasu in essence supported neither. Yamamoto's own main body, despite its much heavier gunpower, lay in a similarly poor position to provide support if called upon. With at least 600 miles between him and Nagumo's fleet carriers, according to the original plan, he would be at least two days steaming away from any trouble they might run into. However, in Yamamoto's mind, the likelihood of this was low. Nagumo's opponent in the opening round of the battle would be solitary and static, namely Midway Island. Obviously, dictating the range to an island was much easier than doing the same with an enemy task force. If Nagumo got in trouble, he could always fall back on the main body. Midway wasn't going anywhere. Not surprisingly, many post-war commentators have criticised Yamamoto's placement of the main body relative to Nagumo, 
However, the remedy proposed by these same commentators, the direct integration of the main body with the striking force, would actually have made little operational sense, even if Yamamoto had decided to dispense with subtlety. Yamato, at 27 knots the fastest of the main body's three battleships, would perhaps have been able to keep up with Kid Butai during a battle, although she was a full knot slower than the slowest carrier in the group, Kaga. However, Nagato and Mutsu were two knots slower than Yamato, and almost ten knots slower than Hairi and S. Rai. As such, they would have been more of a hindrance than a help in any situation where the ability to manoeuvre rapidly was called for. Thus, direct integration of the two forces was not the right answer. Had direct support of Nagumo's carriers with heavy gunfire been needed, it would have made much more sense to have maintained the main body as a separate formation, but also to have kept it close to Nagumo. Yamamoto could have trailed Nagumo at a short distance, so as to be partially shielded by Nagumo's own combat air patrol, CAP, from American air attacks coming from the island. Alternately, and more boldly, the main body could have been placed in advance of the carrier force, providing the Americans with a tempting target and thereby providing an air power sump for the enemy. All of these musings, however, miss the real point. In truth, supporting Nagumo was strictly secondary to the main body's intended mission of destroying the American fleet during the later stages of the battle. This, in turn, points to a central truth about Yamamoto's planning. If the premise is accepted that the Americans would have to be lured from Pearl Harbor in order to create the needed battle, there was no way to construct an operational plan whose distribution of warships was both deceptive and mutually supporting. The two goals were antithetical. Yamamoto knew he couldn't have it both ways, and he willingly sacrificed mutual support to the perceived need for stealth. In a very real sense, this one assumption about the nature of the enemy doomed the battle plan from the start. Notwithstanding Yamamoto's penchant for strategic deception, the arrangement of the various invasion forces approaching from the southwest is also difficult to understand. All were ultimately intended to arrive at roughly the same time off of Midway, albeit with Cond's more powerful group heading up the van during the final approach. Thereafter, Cond would head southeast without his weaker charges. For all this labour, all four groups could just as easily have sailed together from either Saipan or Truk and spared themselves the difficulty of coordination while simultaneously providing a greater degree of mutual protection. Likewise, directly incorporating the four fast, powerful cruisers of Crew Div 7, Mogami, Kumano, Suzuya and Mikuma, into Nagumo's force would have greatly increased his odds of success at little increased risk. Operating directly with Kid Butai, Crew Div 7 could have contributed greatly enhanced anti-aircraft and surface gun power during the actual battle, and still have been easily detached to bombard Midway when the time came. More important, the dozen or so long-range scout aircraft carried by these cruisers would have improved Nagumo's scouting capabilities immensely. Including Crew Div 7 would have made it possible to more than double the number of scout aircraft that were fated to be used on the morning of 5th of June, and commensurately increased the number of aircraft in reserve for following up enemy contacts. Clearly, too, stripping Crew Div 7 from the immediate vicinity of Tanaka's invasion convoy hardly exposed the latter to greater danger, as Kid Butai was the final guarantor of its safety in any case. A commander's job is to orchestrate and direct the three major dimensions of combat space, time and force. From the preceding remarks, it can be seen that Yamamoto's plan failed to address the concept of space in a flexible manner. In his attempt to be divinely mysterious, he had rendered much of his fleet purposeless through dispersion. Many of his forces were positioned in such a way that they could accomplish nothing more meaningful than parading about in the Pacific in lieu of fighting. If they were called on to react to unforeseen developments, they could not do so. What, then, of the other two dimensions, time and force? In these as well, Yamamoto's plan suffered from alarming deficiencies. Nagumo's schedule required him to begin subduing Midway on the 4th, support landings on Cure on the 6th, followed by more landings on Midway on the 7th, and then be ready to fight a major fleet engagement immediately thereafter.
In the course of these operations, Cure was to be placed in operation as a seaplane base within a day of its capture, and Midway restored to fighting order the day after that to be ready to support Nagumo on the 8th. This was, to put it mildly, cutting things a little fine. Cure Island would have been relatively easy to put back into service. Seaplanes require less in the way of facilities for operation, but Midway's airstrip was a completely different matter. Given that Nagumo was to conduct air raids against it from the 4th through the 6th, it hardly seemed likely that the strip would be captured intact or even in working order. This was doubly true if Crudiv 7's guns were actually needed to support the landing operations. The Americans could also be expected to sabotage whatever they could before the island's capture. At the very least, the aviation fuel stores would be torched, and without them, there would be no flight operations from Eastern Island. All in all, despite construction workers accompanying the combat troops, the odds of Midway being transformed literally overnight into a workable base were remote. In addition, by the very strictures of the timetable being imposed on him, Nagumo's freedom of movement was grossly degraded. There was little possibility of his being able to meet unforeseen contingencies while still maintaining the strict tempo of operations the plan called for. No admiral would want to see his options limited in this fashion. Worse yet, the tight timing of Yamamoto's plan was predicated on the belief that the Americans were unaware of Japanese intentions. If that precondition did not hold up, Nagumo's might be in trouble. And despite all the power arrayed around him in distant support, he would be essentially on his own to deal with whatever problems arose. However, with six carriers, Nagumo was assumed to have the capability to deal with any American force that appeared. Freedom of movement would simply be compensated for by superior numbers of aircraft. This, then, was the linchpin upon which the entire operation hung. Force. For all of Yamamoto's defective planning, his obsession with concealment and deception, shotgun approach to objectives, frivolous distribution of assets, and rigid timetable. His operational scheme could probably still have been made good so long as he retained his final trump card, a fully constituted Kid Butai, with all six of its fleet carriers. In the final analysis, since no one was in a position to support them anyway, these were the only ships in the entire operation that really mattered. But with six flat tops at hand, it would have been difficult for Nagumo to lose. The Americans would have been hard-pressed to assemble sufficient numbers of aircraft to oppose them, even with midways thrown into the mix. The three Japanese carrier divisions between them would bring more than 350 planes into the battle, the equivalent of about five American carriers. It was known that the Americans could barely match that number of flight decks in April 1942, even if WASP were in the Pacific. Even in the unlikely event that the Americans were able to bring all their carriers together, they had never operated them as a group before, whereas the Japanese had extensive experience fighting together as a unit. As long as this final variable in the equation held up, Nagumo would have been in a very good position to emerge victorious. However, shortly after having won the April staff battles, Yamamoto had altered his basic operational designs in a way that jeopardised his final trump card, apparently as yet another quid quo pro to the naval general staff for his having run roughshod over them, Yamamoto agreed to lend significant naval support to Fourth Fleet's plans for operations in the southwest Pacific. Admiral Inoue was still determined to capture Port Moresby in New Guinea, as was Naval GHQ. Yamamoto wasn't in favour of Operation MO, as it was known, but he reasoned that if Port Moresby were captured in early May, whatever carriers were used there could still be returned in time for Nagumo's complete force to be reassembled in home waters by mid-May. If so, they could still sally forth on Nagumo's designated sortie date for Midway, which had been set for 26 May. At first, Combined Fleet was of a mind to send just Kaga southward. Having missed the Indian Ocean operation because of the need to repair hull damage suffered in a mooring incident in Palau, she was already in home waters and had just been refitted. This would give Inoue a total of about one and a half carriers, since he already had the brand new light carrier SH under his command. 
Inoue, however, raised strenuous objections to this. The Japanese did not know that the Americans had used two fleet carriers in their 10 March raids against Leh and Salamaua. They suspected that they had been attacked by a combination of Saratoga's air group and land-based air operating from Australia. However, whatever the makeup of the enemy's forces, it was apparent that the Allies now had substantial air forces in the area. It was unlikely that the veteran Kaga and a rookie lightweight like Sheikh H could face up to serious opposition if it should materialise again. As a result, Combined Fleet relented, and on 12th of April issued orders telling Cardiff 5 to proceed via Meko to Truk at the termination of their Indian Ocean sortie. They would be ready to participate in Operation MO thereafter. Yamamoto reasoned that Shikaku and Zuikaku probably couldn't get themselves into too much trouble by participating in Inoue's sideshow, and might even garner some additional training in the process. In the event, they got quite a bit more than they bargained for. The utter illogic of Yamamoto's 12th April decision has been commented on before, but it bears repeating here. By any rational standard, it was absolutely essential to have Cardiff 5 in Nagumo's force if it was to be assured of material superiority at Midway. In effect, the feasibility of Operation MI now depended on whether or not Operation MO came off without Cardiff 5, suffering significant losses. Taking this gamble was a huge mistake, as it held the more important of the two operations hostage to the subordinate's success. What this suggests is that Yamamoto had not so much won the right to set the Navy's strategy as simply to have his plan go first, and even then with provisos. In effect, none of the competing strategic options that he had supposedly suppressed had actually been removed from the mix. They had merely been shoved to the end of the line in terms of timing. Though no one in the fleet would have been willing to admit it, Cardiff 5, despite its relatively junior status, represented Japan's current margin of superiority over the American Navy. No more real fleet carriers were slated to be delivered to the Navy until Taihi Eish, then building, was completed in 1944. In other words, the Japanese carrier force was fixed for the foreseeable future. The Japanese believed they currently outnumbered the US Navy 11 carriers, 6 heavy and 5 light, to 6, 5 heavy and 1 light. If the Imperial Navy was to preserve for itself the freedom of action that had thus far characterised its operations, it was essential to also conserve its numerical superiority, particularly in heavy carriers. Every senior Japanese officer knew that this current numerical ascendancy was bound to be transient. The Americans were known to have more than a dozen Essex-class fleet carriers building, in addition to several light fleet units comparable to HAH and Zui. Japan could not hope to match this output. Therefore, Japan's naval leadership needed to manage its window of opportunity so as to maximise the utility of its assets while this superiority lasted. Such was Japanese confidence in the proficiency of their military, though, that they apparently felt no pangs of uncertainty in committing Cardiff 5 to the south.